Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a, another evening where we come together in Shepherd's Call. Uh, come together to uh, listen, to hear, to speak, to talk, to evangelize, to proclaim, you know, and to uh, take your questions. And so uh, I want to take this opportunity. Uh, I know it's been, it's been a couple months since i uh, been out, but I want to take this opportunity to uh, uh, really thank you, um, that we get to spend this time together uh, because this is a show really it's for you. It's not about um, just coming out and just speaking and just doing, but this is really a show for you. Uh, to start with the meditation for today, I want to, uh, last Sunday in the Chaldean Church, our first reading was taken from Isaiah chapter 6, and it is in connection in the last four weeks of the Chaldean Church calendar. Before we start Advent, which is preparation for uh, the birth of Jesus, we close off the year with four Sundays that are dedicated to the church. Um, it's called the sanctification of the church or the hallowing of the church. And uh, the first reading was taken from Isaiah chapter 6. What I want to do is I want to read it, and then I want to go into what's the role of the church. And when the church speaks in certain issues in certain ways, why in certain things there are opinions within the church that you have the right to listen to or not, and there are teachings within the church that they're not just made up. It has been inspired by God himself. And uh, I say this with all humility, not because, you know, I'm now a clergyman of the church and high up there, uh, and you better listen to me. But this is how God established it, and this is where we need to understand this. And so I'm going to read, and I'm going to... Uh, this is a reading from the Old Testament, which sort of in some ways prefigures what will happen um, in, in the coming of the church. Uh, it was established by, you know, it was done through the prophets, but in the church, the, uh, in the New Testament, the church becomes prophetic in many ways. It's not to say that we don't have prophecy in the sense of being able to proclaim the, the, the word of God. That's what prophecy means. It isn't just, oh, I know when the world is going to end. No, that's, not, that's not real prophecy in the sense of what, what the scriptural prof prophetic word is all about. It's actually um, speaking the word of God and uh, whether in some cases it's a warning or in some cases it is also uh, a resurrection like Ezekiel or in some cases it's about uh, building up. Uh, to prophesy is to speak the word of God. And so this is now Isaiah chapter 6, and it's the vision of Isaiah and the Lord that he has when he's taken up. So I'm going to be skipping a couple of uh, verses here and there, but I want to get into the gist of the reading itself, and then really explain what this is all about and why we're doing this in such an important time uh, in our day. So this is Isaiah chapter 6, verse starting with verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and a strain filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, and each had six wings. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one flew, no, I'm sorry, then flew one of the seraphim to me, having in his hand a burning coal, which he had taken from the tongs uh, from the altar, with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin forgiven. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Hear and hear, but do not understand. See and see, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people fat and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without men, and the land is utterly desolate. And the Lord removes men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Um, we can go on, and, and even though it's got a really strange, weird ending, uh, this, this came as a result of um, Isaiah as being 
sent to prophesy about the destruction of the city. But I don't want to go into that. I'm not prophesying. I'm not using it to talk about the destruction of our cities, even though I think our cities are <laughs> going, they need help. Let's just put it to, to you this way. So here's a couple of points that I want to talk about this vision. Point number one. The vision takes Isaiah to heaven. And in heaven, it's almost like a liturgical place. It's a temple. Um, there's a lot of smoke. And it's very much what a church is, is a symbol and actually somehow on an earthly plane trying to symbolize heaven. And believe it or not, even within the church on the altar area, that's called you know, the, the Holy of Holies. Um, and that's where the uh, uh, heaven is more symbolized inside the church. There are seraphim and there are cherubim and they're all serving God and they're all singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of His glory. Well, when do we sing this in the Mass? Well, we sing this in the Mass, uh, especially in preparation for the Eucharist, which is kind of the strange things about why Isaiah in heaven, first of all, he's unclean, is brought up into heaven. But Isaiah says, well, I'm unclean, I shouldn't be here. He's right. Well, all, does it, all it takes from God is snap of the finger, you've just been made clean. But weirdly, the angel with tongues brings a coal from the sanctuary and touches the lips of Isaiah. Where is that fulfilled in the New Testament? That's a figurement of the Eucharist itself, where in heaven, they didn't need this. Uh, all it takes is for the angel just to come out and say, all right, just touch him over the head and say, you're clean. You're cleared. You don't have to worry about this. But again, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of his glory. And then we add Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's taken from Palm Sunday um, and other Psalms. But that's a preparation for the words of consecration. And the very thing about church is, number one, is to glorify God. And this is why the Chaldean church begins its mass with glory to God in the highest. Second, it's to make Christ available, to purify and to be able to strengthen us because we, whether we're church uh, leaders or church members, are sinful and in need to be purified from God himself. And that's where that tongue from the altar um, is brought up and hot coals touching the lips of Isaiah and purifying him and cleansing him. On Christmas uh, Day, there's a prayer that the uh, servers and the deacons will pray that will say, just as Isaiah brought the uh, burning coal with, its to with tongues to purify the lips, uh, just as the angel brought this to purify the lips of Isaiah, so our lips, how much more so are our lips purified when we receive the body of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And so this is now the other thing about the church. Um, so giving glory to God as well as purifying. And then you hear God saying, whom shall I send? God in heaven with all the glory of the angels says, whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, I'll go. So God is using us, and using us sinful, weak human beings to proclaim the Word of God perfectly, though we are imperfect. And this is where, why should I listen to the church when the church is made out of sinful men and women, especially men who run the church, let's just say, well, amen. We are sinful. We are weak. It's not us. It's not ours. It's not even what I get to make up. It's all about God himself, making him known, giving, making him present. And here's what God says. And this is where it gets really, really odd. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he says, Go and say to this people, Hear and hear, but don't understand. See and see, but you can't perceive, or else your heart, uh, your heart will be filled with fat. Here's, uh, will become fat and whatever. Here's the interesting point. 
God is saying, I want you to look with your eyes and see uh, what is reality. I want you to hear with your ears and hear what is reality, especially that which is coming from above. But when we reject God, we reject truth. And when you reject truth, you reject reality. And here's where the church needs to step in in and speak to you next Tuesday is election night are we going to tell you who to vote for as a person I wish I could but it's very strongly suggested that we don't but you need to see who the candidates are you need to hear what they're all about now put candidates to the side we have propositions Proposition 3. What is Proposition 3 all about? On the surface, Proposition 3 has two basic sections. If you read it, uh, but you need to have the eyes and the ears of a lawyer. Number one, uh, here's what Proposition says, and this is why the church is speaking out. The Catholic church is speaking out. Number one, abortion is non-negotiable. It is evil, it is wrong, and for those who have committed abortion, you need to confess because you need to be healed of an evil that you have done. Um, God's mercy is great. God wants to heal you. God wants to love you. But here is a problem with Proposition 3. It is, of course, being touted as well, this is now bringing back the right to abortion for women. Is it? Uh, yes and no. It isn't just about that. Read the proposition. When lawyers read this proposition, they recognize that when it comes to law and propositions, you have to have details. If you don't have details, then you have a wide range. And so lawyers, when they write something, they have something specific in mind. There are very uh, few guidelines or limitations. Number one, this is touted as women's rights. Number one, it's not. But here's, let's get, even if you're for abortion, and, and abortion is a non-negotiable. Pope Francis said this, I didn't say this. Um, but the church has been teaching it for 2,000 years. Christianity has been teaching it. And any Christian who teaches otherwise is not a Christian. You're a liar. And I'll say it again. You're a liar. You're using Jesus' words against Jesus. Because Jesus does not teach. And the church is very clear about this. And Christianity is very clear about this from day one. And so you have, and I don't want to mention names, some so-called Catholic um, politicians who said that the church taught abortion. No, they didn't. And when you speak on behalf of Jesus Christ in a false way to bring about your own narrative, uh, then you're committing sacrilege and you're not, you're not Christian. Anyways, put that to the side. Let's get a little bit more details. Prop three. And this is why the church is saying I'm going to speak on behalf of not only the church, but God himself is deeming this evil and demonic. Here's the proof. Number one, does it make abortion legal? Yes. Is it just abortion? Here's the thing. It, the, the wording behind it is that um, anyone from the uh, health care, any health care quote-unquote professional, has a right to do an abortion. What does that mean? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't limit. And at any time when it's deemed necessary for the health of the mother, that means that if she is nine months and getting ready to give birth, and she deems that she no longer for psychological health reasons, it doesn't take much, oh, I don't want this baby, done, that she doesn't want this baby, 
And then what they will do is they will breach this baby. You know what breaching is? It's when you take the baby and you pull out the legs. And then what do you do is you sever the neck, you vacuum the brain, and then you pull out the baby dead. I'm not making this up. Please look it up. It's called partial birth abortion. That's a reality with this bill. Point number, I forgot what number we're at. Two, three, uh, any health professional. That means if you're a pharmacist and never done an abortion before, you can do an abortion. You can perform an abortion according to this proposition. Don't take my word for it. Read it. And if there are no guidelines, that means any professional in the health field. Next point. If that professional in the health field screwed up and didn't do the right thing, didn't do it the right way, and the baby is born, or the mother dies, the proposition also says you can't go after the person who committed the abortion. Not my words. It's, it's hidden within the bill itself. It's put veiled for a specific reason to open it up to such a degree that it allows anyone who's in the health field to perform this without any consequence. Now, next consequence. If the child that's supposed to be aborted is born and the mother continues to say that the child is not to be alive because it's supposed to have been aborted. The vague wording of this bill allows the health care professionals in the hospital to not do anything to save the child because this child is deemed aborted. Next, if your child minor ages 12, 13, 14, when they go to a hospital or they need to have any kind of procedure done of any kind with the exception of two things. One, according to this bill, is an abortion seen as a health uh, care. Now, if your child is going to get their tonsils out, they need uh, parental consent. Um, if they're going to cut their toenails, they need parental consent. But if the child got pregnant, and wants to have an abortion, she can have the abortion without parental rights. That's in the bill as well. What's the main goal of the bill? It's to open up all of the evils of abortion and even more parental rights within the bill as well, by the way. It takes parental um, rights away from the family where if the child, now it's no longer just an abortion. If the child wants to transition from one gender to another, if you have a boy who wants to become a girl, if you have a girl who wants to become a boy, and they want to take chemical hormones or go through surgery. The bill actually comes out and gives permission without the need for parental consent. It's there because when you write something this vague, if the child for quote-unquote health reasons, if my little girl wants to become a boy, oh, and by the way, more than likely she will become infertile for the rest of her life. If my boy wants to become a girl, oh, and by the way, he will become infertile for the rest of his life. And as a 13-year-old, as a 12-year-old, as an 11-year-old, as a 10-year-old, as a 9-year-old, as a 14-year-old, as a 15 or a 16 year old, I don't know about you, but a lot of kids when they were 10 or 11 or 12, 
they were fantasizing that they were Batman or giraffes or anything else. Um, when it comes to gender identity, uh, they're not taking that as a childish, wild imagination. Oh, and by the way, they want to empower teachers to do this behind the backs of parents. I'm not lying about this. It's out there. It's already started. President Joe Biden, executive order towards all insurance companies, executive order by the president, our sitting president himself, has put an executive order to say that insurance companies must pay for gender uh, changing surgeries to minors, pay for them 100% and do not need parental consent. That's out there. This goes against God, the church, Christianity, humanity. To go back to God's words to Isaiah. Go and tell these people, see with your eyes, but don't perceive. Hear with your ears, but don't hear anything. What does that mean? There is a game that's being played today. I'm going to use this word purposely. It is demonic, which means it's from the devil himself. When you see a child and they are feeling, or even an adult, when they have issues that are brought up where they feel confused. Um, and today, naming. You know, I was born with these biological gender, but that's not me. I am a woman with male genitalia. No, you're not. And your gender isn't fluid with whatever you feel that day. When you go and buy animals, what is this dog? Is it male or female? Is it gender fluid? When you look at mass graves that, you know, during times of persecution, and you can tell by the bones if they're male or female, do you come out and say, well, there could be gender fluid, non-binary? Well, just because they have male genitalia that there could be female. No. Here's the argument, and it's a horrific argument. And this is what they're trying to install. And you've got some psychological institutions behind it that are actually lying. And I will say it again. Psychological institutions that are actually lying. If you don't go with your child or the person who wants to change their gender, then the likelihood of them committing suicide is great. So what do you prefer? For your little boy to be a girl or your little boy to be dead? Uh, a couple of questions. Number one, where's, where's your data? Um, this all blew up two years ago when certain somebody became president. I don't want to, did that just slip out of my mouth? Yes, it did. This all blew up the last couple of years. If this statement was true, where are the mass suicides five years ago? Especially by the gender identity confused children. 
not only that, there is enough data in the psychological world who bring actual real data and not just throwing out their whatever they feel like throwing. Look, I'm not a psychologist. Have I dealt with this a little bit? Not as much as, but the data is out there. Fact, take the city of San Francisco. The city of San Francisco, before the blowing up of the homosexual community there, and after the blowing up of the homosexual community there, being legal, being in your face, they have parades. San Francisco is basically the uh, gay center of the United States and one of the biggest gay centers in the world, probably second to Paris and maybe a few other cities. Has the suicide rates gone down simply because they're now transitioning or they're now coming out gay and homosexual marriages are legal? No. They're almost exactly the same. And that's troubling because, number one, one suicide is too many. But when they couldn't come out, they felt that they were trapped. When they did come out, they feel that they're trapped. When it is legal, they feel that they're trapped. When, there it is, when it is in the open, they feel that they're trapped. When they are proclaiming it and they're forcing it, they feel that they're trapped. Let me tell you how much it's in your face. I was in D.C. for a conference of Catholic bishops meetings and whatever. Uh, I needed a haircut. True story. Uh, I pulled out my Google app. I said, haircut near me. Gave me five. First one, it says, haircut place, LGBTQ friendly. Second, hair, haircut place. Who I am and who I have sex with, what does that got to do with my haircut? One, two, and three that were closest to me were LGBTQ friendly. Why am I, what am I trying to say? You go to D.C., you see the rainbow flags, and by the way, there's like, what is it, 15 different rainbow flags for the different variations with their interpretations or whatever on, I hate to call them churches because they're not churches, um, in public places, in places where they shouldn't be, and they're throwing it in our faces. Has that changed the uh, rate of those who are in the homosexual community committing suicide? No. Or in the trans community? No. Why? Because they're missing Jesus. Uh, bottom line, but God is sending Isaiah and he's sending us today and it's you. Sending us to say, wake up. Number one, there is no life outside of Jesus. You can't live without the graces of Jesus. and He is our Savior. And He's the one that will bring in peace, inner peace, life, joy. And He's the one that's leading this march against Prop 3. And if you come out and you hear Chaldeans who are saying, oh, the church is fear-mongering, read the bill. What they'll give you, by the way, is a very small section when you go to vote. Read the full bill. Read commentary on the for and against. I'm not afraid of anybody. For and against. Rebuttals against each other. See how vague, purposely written. And again, lawyers, when they write bills, they get very specific to get a certain point. When they keep these things really vague, that means it's completely open for anyone, anywhere, anything, anytime. And that's what's happening today. I need to talk about a lot of other things too. I can spend the next 45 minutes and I want, I need to take questions, but there's a lot of other idiotic, ridiculous things that are happening today. Bottom line, Proposition 3, the Catholic Church, the Pope himself, Jesus Christ himself is saying through the church, no, it's murder, it's evil. It's disgusting, it's horrific, it's bad. It's not, it doesn't give women uh, freedom. It actually takes away freedom from women. Um, and that's the evil thing behind it. So, 
Whew, got that out of the way. Uh, that only took half hour. Um, let's open it up. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Uh, and God willing, we'll be able to bring you more stuff on the stuff. Hi. Good evening, Bishop. How well, are you? Well, good evening to you. Think good, good, good. Um, this is getting heated on Proposal 3, so be prepared. Good. Bring it. At what point will you ask someone not to present themselves for Holy Communion who claims they are Chaldean Catholic, who is openly promoting abortion slash Proposal 3 on social media and other public outlets, going against other moral teachings in the Catholic Church? You can't be Catholic and pro-abortion. Worse, you cannot influence children and bring them down with you too. Right. This question applies to those who have taken their views publicly and have viciously maligned the teaching of the Holy right. Mother Church. Good. Very good point. Uh, very good question. Let's start with um, Archbishop Salvatore Cordiglione uh, has called uh, Nancy Pelosi that in her views about um, abortion and she is um, skewing and by the way she was the one that said the Catholic Church taught abortion at one time I didn't mention a name but I'm throwing a name it was her and the church responded to her she didn't care uh, and so he has called her to say um, do not receive communion here's the thing that debate has come up in um, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. There's two important things that the church needs to do at the same time, and it needs some wisdom. In the beginning, it needs to teach, teach, it needs to teach truth, period, no matter what. But it also needs to teach mercy. Those who are teaching the untruth to at least call them out or call them out and uh, go and invite them to understand. Because here's the thing. There is, you know, um, a lot of times when people get heated, uh, then I don't care what the truth is, I am fighting you. And the church is still trying to figure out both. The church, as you can hear, and if you've heard, that the church is very clear in coming out and speaking about Proposition 3. And the church, and I will say this, that any Chaldean who is saying that the church is wrong about Prop 3 are wrong. And anyone who's coming out and saying that this is about women's rights, they're wrong. And this is about just having abortion rights, it's wrong. Even, and, and here's the interesting thing, by the way, side note, even abortion rights people are against this bill. When they read the vagueness and the depth of this bill and what it opens up because of its vagueness um, are against this bill. Now, the church does not want to come out and, and all of a sudden scour the internet and look for Chaldeans who are saying vote yes on this bill and then put them on the blacklist and start calling them up and say, hey, you can't go, uh, basically saying you're excommunicated, you're excommunicated, you're excommunicated, you're excommunicated, you're excommunicated. There has to be mercy. There has to be a call to mercy. When Jesus met with a woman who was caught in adultery, first and foremost, he says, who has the right to throw the first stone? Nobody. And he came out and said, has anybody judged you? And she said, no, and neither do I. But go and sin no more. So now it becomes the question of where is mercy and where is truth? You need both. So we need to preach it. We need to teach it. And all those Chaldeans who are preaching against the Catholic Church need to be given the opportunity and the chance to be forgiven. And sometimes that takes, it took, Arch, it took Archbishop Cordiglione 10 years. Am I saying it should take us 10 years? No. One thing we don't want to do is completely just isolate the sinners because if you do that I who would be doing the isolating will be need to be isolated on the sinner too just like Isaiah uh, and this becomes important but we're not just talking about sin we're also talking about teaching 
and therefore I will come and say this. Anyone Catholic or Christian who says that abortion is acceptable by God or it is a, uh, an issue that the church should not get involved in are wrong. And anyone who says that Christianity allows abortion are liars. They're either lying to themselves and to the world or they're willing to come up with any excuse just to say that. Let's begin with that. Um, the church is in a very particular situation where it wants to show mercy with truth. You know, Pope Benedict wrote a beautiful letter called Charity in Truth. So we need to show charity. We don't step down from the truth. And this is where some of the quote-unquote Christian churches who come out and say, well, God loves everybody, including homosexual couples. Uh, yes, but when um, they sent a, 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 uh, a question to the Vatican about can a priest give a blessing to homosexual couples, the answer was very clear. Uh, everyone has a right to a blessing. Couples who are in a homosexual relationship cannot receive a blessing because God does not bless sin. And this is the important point. It is a sin to be in a homosexual relationship. It is not a sin if I can't help my attraction to male to male, female to female, even, I'm going to say this, uh, even to any kind of attraction. Uh, it doesn't matter. I can't help attraction sometimes. Um, I need to work on it. I need to not concentrate on why, why do I have this and whatever. There's things that you can do to uh, you know, concentrate on other things, to build up a greater relationship with Christ, to be able to overcome these attractions because you're going to have an attraction to a married person, you know, a heterosexual and still wrong. You know, um, to follow up and to, pro you know, proceed on those uh, attractions. Um, so not every attraction is right, but on the other hand, there is a need for um, an understanding that certain types of attractions are inherently wrong. Number one, attraction to children in a sexual manner, inherently wrong. By the way, this is what schools are trying to do with pedophilia, and this is what they're trying to overly sexualize our children with uh, a lot of literature and a lot of material, and it's sick and it's disgusting, and it needs to be fought. Um, maybe we'll talk about that later, uh, maybe not. We'll see if we get a question on that. But again, if somebody has a sexual attraction to a child, it is wrong, it is a sin. You can't help the attraction, but you could help what you do with this attraction. Number two, if you have a homosexual attraction, it is wrong. And the church is very clear that um, there are certain types of attraction that are inherent in the very sense of the, the attraction itself is wrong. No, you cannot in any way change that. Uh, you can't have a love story or a movie called Bros and try to change that. It doesn't work. You can't have a homosexual attraction that is legitimate. Uh, it means that in some cases, in many cases, that I can't help it, but I can't follow up on it. You can't have and follow up on an attraction to somebody who's already married. I already mentioned this. Could be heterosexual, but uh, that is also illegitimate. You can't have a sexual attraction to an animal coming up very soon. You will see it coming up because all the signs are already there. It's already starting up. And one of the ugly things that people have already started up saying and doing is that um, people have started to see themselves as animals. I identify as a bird, cat, dog, giraffe. You're not. I don't care what you feel. See with your eyes or you don't want to see. Hear with your ears. And this is going to be, 
this generation is going to be so embarrassed that 50 years from now, people are going to look at us and go, what? What, 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 what? And we have proof of this. It's all over TikTok. It's all over YouTube. It's all over everything. What? What, what do you mean they identified as a dog? Oh, and by the way, they've already started to put in schools, in bathrooms, places where children who identify as cats and dogs to do it in, I don't know, I don't even want to finish with that. Um, I've heard that there were janitors that left the school because kids were peeing and pooping everywhere. So now they're putting kennels. Now you've got kids in the middle of class doing whatever they want to do. Um, this just recently, and you think, oh, this is all out there, this is all fantasy. Chaldeans removed their children from a specific school here in the Detroit area because the teacher identified herself as a squirrel. If you want to raise your hand, you need to scratch like a squirrel. That's the word that I got. That's where we're living today. That's wrong. And this is where we need Jesus, now more than ever. I hope that answers that question. <clears throat> it I took sure it into so did. many different loops and areas. We have a lot of great questions coming from Facebook. Anyone Facebook Live, send your questions and we will ask them. Yes. We have a three-part question. Three-part question. That'll take about an hour and a half. We're going to limit you. Yes. What are the consequences of getting an abortion or being transgender? How would God judge someone who is bisexual or gay? And what if they don't know Jesus? Okay. Very good question. Let's take the first one. There's a huge difference between abortion and, 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 um, transgender. and transgender. Abortion, um, and I've dealt with men and women, I mean women, I should say, and men, um, who've had abortions or have forced abortions, and I can't tell you the sorrow, the grief that they feel because of knowing what they did. Even at the time they felt that they were trapped, that there was no other way of doing things. My parents would kill me if they found out, especially if they found out who the father is, and all of that. And I've had women come to me before they had abortions. And in some cases, I was able to talk them out. In other cases, I couldn't. And um, somebody actually sent me a card. Uh, I hadn't heard from her in, in a long time. She sent me a card saying that um, this is a child that you helped save. And she has a little bit of guilt in her that she at any time felt that she wanted to abort this child. Um, not married. Her parents ostracized her. Her mother proclaims that she doesn't have a daughter. And so this woman who made a mistake but corrected her mistake um, is living in a different state. And she's brave. Absolutely brave. Um, she does not have the guilt of an abortion. So abortion, what it does is it kills your soul. Um, if you don't get on it, God looks at every sinful person the same way. I love you. I want to heal you. Don't let this kill you. What the devil wants is when you feel that you're trapped and you have no other way of doing anything, you have to have an abortion. That's the devil's way of having it. And then for some, in some cases, I have had, oh, I feel relieved. I don't have to worry about this. My parents don't need to know. I learned my lesson, whatever, whatever, whatever. But then it creeps in. Um, depression, in many cases, by the way, comes in. By the way, other health problems, um, especially with women, breast cancer goes up, I think, what is it, 46% higher rate of breast cancer for women who have had abortions, um, if I remember the, the, the numbers correctly. Um, other types of health issues that come in, put all those to the side, psychological issues, depression, in some cases, suicide because of the abortion, not just because they were just simply 
uh, depressed beforehand or whatever. Um, as I said, before an abortion, God says, please don't. You're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt another life. I just read this, by the way. I, I thought this was marvelous. We have the technology today to perform surgeries on infants in the womb. And somebody made this statement. I thought this was brilliant. I never thought about this. Um, they have to give um, pain-killing medication to the uh, infant in the womb in order to do the surgery. Why? Because the infant will feel everything. Now, put in a foreign object that is out to kill it. Saline, it's poison. Vacuum, you vacuum the arms and the legs and then the head and then whatever. The child feels it all from the very beginning. There are actually x-rays of a child. That's, they were taking an x-ray of a woman having an abortion and how the child is fighting it. It's ridiculously disgusting. The child feels it. And the mother who is um, mystically, um, religiously, I don't know, spiritually connected with this child um, will feel it someday. That's different than trans. Uh, trans, you're basically lying to yourself. I, and there are men who make themselves look like women they look absolutely like women, 100%. I mean, that's how good we can do things today. Are they women? No. Their body structure doesn't say they are. They will never be able to have children, even if they do. And I actually read this of recent times. There was a medical uh, doctor who said, you know, a man who has transitioned into woman, well, what a, one day science will be able to allow us to have children. And this medical, uh, this lady in the medical field came out and said, your bones are not able to, they're not the bones of a woman. And if you do, you will actually break your hip bones, your this bones and those bones. And she went through all of this and you will basically bleed to death and die. You will not be able to have a child because God did not create you physically to be able to have a child. You male, you man. And so somebody who's living with that, um, in some cases, and we do know about those who've gone through transition surgeries and regretted it, uh, many times have regretted it, um, the regret is on a different plane. Um, and uh, again, God looks and overlooks upon everybody with sympathy, with love, but with truth as well. Um, God wills that all be saved. That includes those who have had abortion. That includes all those uh, who have transitioned. That includes all those who are pushing for Prop 3. God wills that they be saved as well. But God's not going to force it. And that's important to recognize and to understand. That's question number one. What was question what part one? What was part two again? I'll try to be brief with the other. Part two was how would God judge someone who is bisexual or gay? What if so, they don't know Jesus? So, so here's the thing. Um, God made me this way. I want to go into that. No, he didn't. But there are things in this world that are disordered. Like I might have a disordered liking for a child and I want to have sexual relations with a child. If that is true, that's not from God. Um, so there, is, there are disorders. There's also physical as well as psychological as well as spiritual disorders. Uh, God views you as he views any and every child. He looks at Mother Teresa with love and he looks at the gay uh, feel, person who's got gay homosexual tendencies, whether they act on it or not, with love. But God wants to lead, God wants to guide, God wants to change, God wants to fix. Uh, God will not bless. Right? Not my words. Pope Francis said this. God will not bless your homosexual marriage. Unacceptable. But God wants to bless you who happens to be in a homosexual marriage and wants to bless you out of it. And that's the important thing. Part three. No more parts in that question. Oh, there was one, two, and three. Three was, what if they don't know God? 
Oh, what if they, oh, there you go. What if they don't know God, God knows them. God will still go after them. God will still want to work with their conscience. God will, uh, God will still want to lead them and guide them. God will love them. And what we read in Romans 1 and Romans 2, basically, Romans 1 is that the way God created the world, he reveals his love and his beauty throughout the world. And God wants to tell them that there's something greater. So this is where in the church teaching, there's something that's called natural law. Natural law is uh, a law that goes beyond uh, any religion. Thou shall not kill. Well, you don't need to be Christian to know you shall not kill. You know, you shall not steal your, you know, someone else's spouse. You know, you shall not steal. You know, you shall not disrespect somebody else or, you know, you should not. These are things that are natural, part of the natural law. Um, and so God puts the natural law in us to say that I love you. That they understand that there's something greater. Some people worship in a dumb way. Uh, Mother Nature. Mother Nature is not God. Mother Nature reveals God but she's not God. You know, Mother Nature has a God that she gives praise to, and that's what some of the Psalms would talk about, nature giving praise to God. So God will always be running after you because God loves you. Um, but it's time sometimes to stop, to hear, to listen, and to turn towards God and say, here I am. Bishop, we have a phenomenal question. Oh boy, as if the other ones weren't phenomenal. They were all phenomenal. They're like, this is just flowing perfectly. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Abortion kills the soul, but so does the community. When a Chaldean woman is not married and makes a mistake, the community casts stones and talks so much about that woman, which is truly unfortunate. Right. Where is the support of the community and the church to stop that gossip and avoid women from aborting and the response to that shame? Beautiful question. Here's, here's the answer. Number one, uh, St. James talks about the tongue. And in the tongue that... You know, everybody has the freedom to say whatever they want to say. The church cannot stop the community from gossiping. It can't. Let me put it to this way. I'm a bishop in the, in the church. What I do in my private time, if I have a moral conscience, I will not gossip. If I don't have a moral conscience, I will gossip. That doesn't change simply because the church teaches don't gossip. Or, or don't tear anybody down. Now, why do I say that? It's because there are men and women, notice how you use the word men and women, who gossip, who feel need to talk about others. It's a way of shaming others because they, wanna, they don't want to deal with their own shame. It's so much more entertaining when I talk about somebody else's sins. But when you talk about my sins, I don't like it, I don't want it. Um, so... Uh, Every individual has the right to do God's work or go against God. So you can't stop gossip. And, and just as a side note, I've used this word and I did it purposely. One day in a homily, I said the Chaldean community does not gossip. There's no such thing as a Chaldean community that gossips. It's you who happens to be Chaldean, who happens to be in the community, who've made a decision to gossip, and therefore that responsibility is on you, not on the vague idea of the Chaldean community. Take responsibility for your own sin. That's important. Now, what the church, um, the Catholic church at large, now the Chaldean church as well, we have started an office called uh, uh, Office for Life, Kellyan uh, Church Office for Life, and it's on our website. If there is a married person or a non-married person, and we have helped and we are helping um, discreetly help someone who is troubled by a pregnancy, um, for whatever reason, they're having a hard time dealing with that pregnancy where they want to abort it for whatever reason. It could be for health reasons, or the health of the child, because in some cases, uh, the child has been deemed um, throwawayable because they're, you know, they might have an extra chromosome or not enough chromosomes, which will mean that they will not be um, 
in any way fully healthy like a regular human being, and therefore they're less human. Um, they might have certain types of uh, issues or whatever, and therefore they should be aborted. And they could be married couples, they could be single couples. Uh, it could be a problem, abortion, uh, problem uh, pregnancy because I'm not married and it'll bring shame to the family. In any and every case, number one, we want to say we love you. Number two, we promise to help you. Uh, number three, um, you can send anonymous um, uh, please through the website. Uh, our website is kaldeenchurch.org. Um, there is a section on Office for Life. And uh, we're doing our best to try to help to save every child. Um, there used to be a, an argument against us. And it was, hey, are you willing to accept every child? Are you willing to raise every child? The answer is yes. These were the words of Mother Teresa. Give me your child. I'll take care of them. Don't abort them. And that's the interesting thing. Because a lot of times they will use the word child. Interesting. Are you willing to raise the child? Don't you know that it is a child in the womb? <sighs> well, beautiful question. Thank you. Beautiful question. We have a follow-up to Office for Life. What are the church's teachings on adopting a child if you're not married, but you feel called to adopt a child and become a father slash mother? Very good question. Um, uh, it depends on if you're living in a sexual, I mean, in a sinful uh, situation. So, for example, I'm not married, but I'm living with my girlfriend and we want to have a kid. No. Um, but if I'm a single dad um, and I want to adopt a child, um, I don't know of any words that say you should or you shouldn't. Um, on the other hand, it, I'm going to say two things. It's not the most ideal way to raise a child because if you are just a male to have a child or a female to have a child, so you'll be a mother or you'll be a father. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's beautiful. I also think that it's also difficult um, because the child will not have both parents. But on the other hand, and I'm going to contradict that, I do know of one parent families because the spouse ran away, died, got divorced, and so where the mother became the mother and father, where the father became father and mother. Uh, there is no church teaching to deny um, a single person from adopting. I will, I'll, be, I'll give you my personal opinion. Um, I, I, I would just hope, because I've, I've seen it too many times, that um, children need a mom and a dad. But does this mean that a, a married woman who lost her husband has to get married? No. Uh, does this mean that a dad who just lost his wife, for whatever reason, has to get married? No. Is it more difficult? Yes. So, uh, there's no church teaching uh, to say yay or nay. Um, but... Adopting children, um, especially um, those who are needy, uh, I think is a worthwhile and I think it's a beautiful thing. Couples who can't have children who also will come out and say that I don't think I could love this child like my own, I will honestly say, is it true? If it really is true, then for God's sakes, don't adopt. But the very likelihood of that being true in many cases, is false, which means that it's a worthwhile thing to look into adoption, and it's a beautiful thing. Great answer, Bishop. How important is it for priests to tie current issues to the gospel and other readings into their homilies? Uh, I, I think if you only talk about social issues, um, I think you failed. The gospel... Um, something important we need to recognize about the gospel. The gospel speaks to me today in every issue that I'm going through, in every situation that I'm going through. And it's important for the, for, for the priest to be able to do it. There are times, my opinion, uh, there's no specific teaching that says you always need to do this or you always need to do that. Um, my opinion, number one, you need to concentrate on Christ in the gospel. Uh, it's not just about 
hey, do this, hey, don't do that. Um, and it, it could be, you know, uh, social issues or whatever. Um, but the very nature of God himself is about social justice, and it is about leading others um, to be able to live everyday life. There's actually a full book in the Old Testament about common sense things that you need to live. You know, it's the book of Proverbs. And a lot of times the book of Proverbs in the olden days were used to um, convert tribes who are barbarians. Because to have good manners is part of growing, uh, what do you call, in spirituality, believe it or not. You know, how you deal with elders, how you deal with food, how you deal with certain situations. So there is important things behind that, and that is important. Um, but if, if the homily is only about social justice, I think you miss Jesus. And if the homily is just theological things about God and only, and it doesn't practically speak to me, then I think you miss Jesus. I think the question is asking how important is it and challenging is it to enter, to enter in the current issues with the homily? Uh, desperately needed. Desperately needed. But uh, you don't want to just make that as uh, just the center of every homily. Let's move on to a different and more uplifting topic. Oh, good. Congratulations on the purchase of the new retreat center. We're very oh, happy. Fantastic, yes. It's a huge blessing for our diocese. Yes. And we know it needs a lot of renovations. Yes. When will the res renovation start? When do you think they'll finish? And if someone wants to donate money, how do they do so? It's a great, great question. Um, we are now being engaged with architects as well as uh, engineers to look into the different changes and different things that we want to do. Um, we, after we, uh, it, it's, it's going to take a while for them to come back and to say, we found it, to, we, we need to do A, B, C, and D, and it will cost A, B, C, and D after we bid it out, and then we will need to sit back and go, is A worth it, B worth it, C worth it, and D worth doing or not? Um, I think it's going to take some time uh, before anything like that happens. Um, in regards to donating, uh, we're always open, we're always in need. Uh, the place is a little bit older. Um, it does need a lot of renovations. It does need some time. Uh, it needs some, also some uh, uh, tender, loving care. Uh, thankful for a beautiful family that stepped up and donated. You know, it was the, the, the children of uh, Shamasha Sivu and uh, Najma uh, Boji. Uh, their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Um, they stepped up and said, we want to make a difference in the community for this generation and for many generations to come. And that's a beautiful thing and a wonderful thing. Um, the maintenance of the place is left on us. They still have some money that they want to continue to donate, but it's not going to be enough to do all of the changes that are necessary. Um, things like that, and we're also talking about the camp and different changes that we want to bring to the camp and bringing in experience for our children so that um, one of the things is that we don't want our children uh, to be just left to whoever wants to speak to them and try to change their minds. We want to give them the teachings of the church, uh, teachings of Jesus Christ. We want to give them Christ himself. We want them to grow in faith and to be strong in faith, uh, whether they're children in the camp or even children or older, whether it's in the camp or in the retreat center, for them to be solid men and women. Um, and the way you do that is in, in the faith and, and taking on Christ. Um, so uh, you can always, you know, uh, find ways uh, online as well as sending them to the uh, to the uh, the diocese. My guess, pure guess, it's going to take us some months um, because if we don't do this right in the beginning, um, it's going to give a very bad impression. There's a lot of things at the place. By the way, going back to the retreat center, uh, it doesn't have AC, and in the winter you don't need it. In the summer. You desperately need it, uh, especially as summer's here. Um, so these are one of the things that need to be looked at. Uh, the original building was built in 1905. Um, so there are, there's been additions that have been put in. Um, and there's, there's also uh, some uh, needed cosmetic work as well as some deep stuff that need to be changed. So we're, we're excited. We, I want it open now. 
but the reality of it right now, uh, it's going to take it's going to take a, it's going to take a while. It's going to take some money too. Um, so thank you for this question. It's a beautiful question. I appreciate it. And uh, the diocese is is focused, and God has been opening up doors for us. We are focused on this current generation and all its ages to build for the next generation. We're not going to let this generation go to waste. Um, we don't care what's going on in the world. We do care, but we're not going to let that, I should say. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it seeps in, but we're not going to let that destroy us. We've dealt with worse sin and problems, much worse than this. And God is with us. And if God is with us, who can be against us, as St. Paul says? On the church's website, is there going to be a place where people can donate for the retreat center? A specific I believe, spot just for, for that for specific it? spot, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I'll have to talk. I'll have to check. Um, if there isn't, send in an email because don't rely on my memory. Um, or you can send in checks or whatever to the diocese specifically writing for the retreat center. And <clears throat> we do have, uh, we are creating a fund for that specifically. Um, so if there isn't somewhere in the diocese, um, you can send in a, an email or send in a, uh, uh, a request uh, saying that. It's a great idea, by the way. You mentioned um, that this retreat center, retreat center is for generations to come. Right. Why do you think in just one generation, Chaldeans have forgotten their Chaldean roots? I don't think Chaldeans have forgotten their Chaldean roots. I think many have, and this is a part of going into a, um, a new world. Uh, America is a new world. But uh, I don't think we've forgotten our roots. Our, our roots begin with Jesus Christ. Um, along with Jesus Christ, there are other things that we do culturally. Um, language is one, even though language is, uh, is a difficult one to try to maintain, because if you don't maintain it in the house, in the home, it's very difficult for the church to teach your kid one hour a week for six weeks or 12 weeks or whatever, and then expect them to become fluent in it. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, but uh, language... Uh, Identity, culture, faith, the way we pray, um, the way we gather, the way we uh, fast, you know, uh, beginning, you know, with a three-day fast with Ba'utha. Um, these, are, these are Chaldean roots. And um, again, it starts with Jesus and everything else that's built upon who we are and what we do. Now, Chaldean communities and identities take on a different shape. Um, Chaldeans who... 500 years ago. Chaldeans in Iran, or modern-day Iran, are different than Chaldeans in Iraq, different than Chaldeans in Turkey, um, similar but different um, in Chaldeans and everywhere else, not only from language, but also identity as well as whatever. Um, over a thousand years ago, we knew that we know that there were Chaldeans from the, the modern-day uh, country of Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, um, as well as other places. Did they live the same way as those who were in Lebanon? No, they didn't. There's similarities, a lot of language similarities, but there's a lot of language differences as well. Um, and uh, that's important to keep in mind. But what we want to do is keep Jesus alive in the Chaldean church, and that will actually strengthen the Chaldean families and to maintain a lot of Chaldean identities and roots. Bishop, unfortunately, we're living in the day and age that we are with a lot of mentally unstable people. A couple of months ago, Father Rodney was verbally attacked during his homily. Okay. And recently, Father Brian was attacked during his homily. Is the church taking extra precautions for the safety of the church, the priest, and its people, especially when we have ordinations or final vows for the Maserat? Um, more people have become vocal, sure. And... Um Today I had a clergy meeting, we talked about uh, briefly that we need to look into safety of different um, parishes and everything like that. Uh, I think that's important. Um, instability, you know, we need to look for whatever we can do. There's only so much we can do. There was no sign that said, that revealed that this person was going to yell out in a homily. There is, I mean, even if you put, let's say, well, I don't know, 
FBI agents who are looking for people who might step up and speak out. How are they going to know who's going to speak out and who's going to talk? There are certain things that we can't do because it doesn't exist. There are no um, qualifiers to show that if somebody has their hair put up a certain way that identifies them that they will do certain things. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, and that becomes important to realize there are certain things we can do and there are certain things we cannot do. Um, I, I don't think it's a right thing to, you know, put metal detectors and, you know, frisk everybody that walks into the church and check their handbags and check their back pockets. At least I don't think we need, I don't think we're living in a world that we have that. God forbid if we do, then we will need to change and we will need to adapt. But in the meantime, um, you know, we're trying in, in many different ways. Um, there are those who are... Um, working and volunteering in the church. And in some cases we are, especially in high uh, times like, you know, like, I don't know, Christmas, Easter and things like that. Is it important to bring in securities or is it also important to bring in those that will help inside the parking lot or inside the church? Sure, absolutely. We have a question um, that someone is really sad about and he wants answered. Sure. I was told by one of the priests that we as lay people were either not allowed or precluded from blessing anyone but our families. This bothered me because I, was, I try to bless anyone I come across in my daily activities and be a blessing in any way I can. In the CCC 1669, it says it is our baptismal right to bless others. Can you please clarify the church's teachings on this? Look it up and read it for me. Um, I'll give you, before uh, we read 1669 from the CCC, Kelly, uh, Kelly, I'm sorry, Catechism of the Catholic Church, um, every baptized person has a right to bless. Uh, if a priest said that, maybe the priest didn't understand what you were saying, or the priest is wrong. Um, we do come from a culture that uh, blessings are limited to priests. That's a cultural thing. That's not a religious thing. It's a cultural thing because... You know, we came out of the village um, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, that every priest that would walk by, everybody would stand up, and everybody would kiss their hands, and everybody will, will uh, whatever. Um, that, uh, that's a beautiful cultural thing. I'm not saying that that's a religious. Uh, so sometimes people will answer culturally, and sometimes uh, culture might be wrong. So read it for me. Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1669. Got it. Sacramentals derive from the baptismal priesthood. Every baptized person is called to be a blessing and to, be a, and to bless. Hence, lay people may preside at certain blessings. The more a blessing concerns ecclesial and sacramental ecclesial. life. Ecclesial. That's church related. And sacramental life, the more in its administration reserved to ordained ministries slash bishops, yep. priests, or deacons. Beautiful. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the official teaching of the church, identifies two things. Number one, every single person who is baptized is baptized into Jesus Christ, who has received the blessing of Christ and has the right and the responsibility, not just the right, the responsibility to bless other people. So, I, you know, I, I, somebody uh, in your family says, I've got a headache, put your hands on them and say, God bless you. God heal you. Nothing wrong with that. A perfect stranger that is open to being blessed, bless them. Nothing wrong. But what the Catechism of the Catholic Church is saying also, when it, there's a difference between a sacrament and a sacramental. A sacramental is uh, something that does not need a priest to do uh, a lot of times. You know, a sacramental could also be using holy water to bless somebody. Uh, it takes a priest to bless the water, at least a deacon, to bless the water. But any lay person can use holy water and bless people with it. That's a sacramental. So now when it becomes much more liturgical or much more official when it comes close to sacraments, that's when it's only limited to a priest. So for example, only a priest um, can do confirmation. Deacons cannot. Baptism in emergency situations, a, a baptized person, and even a non-baptized person has a right to do uh, but it's extreme situations. Uh, confession, only a priest. Marriage, 
uh, in the Eastern rites, it's, it's only a priest, even though it's based upon a vow ba uh, that is given by a man and a woman. So if a man and a woman who have never been married are stuck in an island, they can proclaim their vows to each other and be married. You know, then they can receive the blessing of the priest later on. There, so there isn't a necessary thing. Um, bishops are the only ones that can ordain priests or deacons. Um, I don't care if you take all the priests in the world and bless somebody, they don't, they don't become priests. And, and that's the, the way it's been given to us, basically. Um, I have heard of uh, extremes on both sides. One extreme is only the priest has a right to bless. Wrong. The opposite is everybody has a right to bless, including celebrate Mass. And I actually mentioned this in a homily last Sunday. And that is, uh, I, I visited a, a, a home where there is somebody who, a, a handicapped son who is unable to come to Mass. And one Sunday I couldn't go and give him communion and um, because I was asked to, and, but, I, but I made it up. I was able to go the following Sunday. And they said, you know, we had some people over our house. And they said, well, the priest couldn't come. So, hey, bring bread. Let's celebrate Mass right now. And I said, what? And she said, I was shocked. I didn't know what to say. She says, yeah, what does it take? Here, bring bread. And they blessed it and broke it and said, this is my body. That's a sacrilege. Not only that, um, if you look at St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, when there are abuses of the Eucharist, St. Paul says the abuses go as far as some people are sick and some people are dying. He doesn't come out and say, you know, you're abusing the Eucharist, everybody celebrate your own masses at home. It doesn't work that way. It's, this is now an abuse. And so one extreme, only the priest, it's wrong. And you heard the official teaching of the Catholic Church, and I brought, I'm glad that you brought that up. And the opposite extreme is everybody can do everything. That's also wrong. I hope this clarifies and I hope this helps. And, and be gentle, don't go up to the priest and say, I told you, the bishop said this, and, you should, you know, and here's the video. No, that's, that's, that's not the right way of doing things. Uh, I would say continue blessing, continue doing, continue to follow those guidelines that have been given to you. So even us as Eucharistic ministers, if someone comes with crossed arms or a little child, we're allowed to bless them? That's a very good question. That's been debated. Um, a lot of people say yes, and a lot of people say no. Uh, you know, uh, the, the one thing that you can do is everybody has a right to bless. So uh, until the church, as far as I know, um, I, again, this has been debated. I've seen arguments against it. Right now, I would say, give them a blessing. Um, it's not going to hurt them. Next question is about birth control. Is it a sin for a health care provider to give prescription for birth control if requested by a patient? I'm about to be a practitioner, and pretty sure it is, but I need to figure out how to not do this. Very good question. I know people who are in the field who were hired in certain places and they said, I don't, I don't, these, this goes against my faith, this goes against my religion, and therefore I will do not um, prescribe or, or fulfill these prescriptions if they're pharmacists or prescribe these things, uh, whatever. Um, in certain times, in certain situations, um, birth control pills. Uh, are actually given for other diseases. So, for example, uh, I know that somebody who might have a cyst in the, in, the, um, in the ovaries, and one of the medications that are given out is um, a birth control pill. Uh, it is not to regulate birth. It's, to, it's a medicine against the cyst with a side effect of regulating birth. Whether the person is married or not, they are allowed to take birth control pills in those cases. Um, and so be very careful about that. I think also uh, it becomes important to be able to recognize also that certain birth control pills are actually abortifacients, like the day after pill. That's not birth control. Um, because if sexual relations occur at a certain time, uh, within, I don't know, uh, when th the, the egg and the sperm come to meet each other, anything that you do to stop that is, is abortion. 
And so the day after pill is an abortion. Uh, and that's an important thing. So certain things that they think are contraceptives are not, they're abortifacients. Um, contraception is wrong, um, with the exception of what I mentioned for other health issues, but you're not taking it for contraception. You're using contraceptive medication for other, re other health issues. But to take them for contraceptive uh, reasoning is wrong. Um, and as much as possible to uh, find ways around that. And as I mentioned, some people have come out and said that I don't, uh, when they get hired, they, it's against my religion, it's against my faith, it's against my whatever, I don't do that. Um, you know, certain patients are told that, you know, we, you know, I want a refill of my whatever, well, we don't do it here. There are other places where you can go and you can be very nice about it and whatever. And it's not easy. It's not easy at all. And God help uh, everyone who's in the... Uh, uh, and the medical field that have to deal with these kinds of issues. We're going to end with one final question. Yes. What does it mean to have a properly formed conscience? It's a great question. It's being able to, number one, be in contact with Christ through prayer, um, be in contact with Christ through learning, through teachings like the catechisms of the scriptures, uh, and knowing what's right and what's wrong uh, through what God has given us. And it isn't just... I think or I don't think God does this or God doesn't do this because the emphasis is I. Um, but the emphasis should be Christ. But Christ as God does not want us to um, make it up as we go along uh, and does not want to leave his truth based on uh, our opinion. So to build up your faith conscience, it starts with Christ, it starts with prayer, being able to pray as well as learning, praying, teaching, listening, hearing, um, meditating, and the Spirit of God will work through you. He will work through your memory and things that you learned, read, studied. He will also uh, work through your soul and to give you the strength to overcome uh, certain adversities and certain issues. He will also work with um, opening up opportunities or closing um, issues where he will lead and guide. Um, there are times when you're going to find difficulties and God is going to be there with you and he will not leave you. Um, and when you feel that all doors are closed and I have no option but to commit a certain sin of some sort, um, God is there. And to form your conscience is to know and to remember that I feel alone, but I know my, you know, uh, there's a great line, and I'm trying to remember who wrote it. I think it was Job. I know that my Redeemer lives. And, and it's a beautiful line. I'm pretty sure it's Job. I could be wrong, and, and I will look it up afterwards. Um, and it's a great line because my Redeemer is with me. He hasn't left me. He's not dead. He, he, my Redeemer lives is resurrection, presence, he's with me, he's never left me, and having uh, trust and hope with that um, allows you to be um, well-formed in your, your life and your faith and, and your understanding, and uh, Jesus will never leave me, um, and, and I think that becomes important to start with that trust and then to build on that trust. That is in Job 19.25. Oh, good. I got it right. You Oof. got it right. You passed. Thank you. Bishop, we want to thank you so much for spending this evening with us, taking questions and answering all of them. Thank you for uh, being patient with me, especially in the first half hour. Um, there's a lot of issues that are going on, but you know, we, it's only because Jesus loves you, the church loves you, and we love you. And because of that, we want to live that grace. So let's pray. May the Lord Jesus Christ fill you with his peace, with his grace, with his love, with his joy, and with his presence, that wherever you may be, whatever that you are dealing with, that the Lord Jesus Christ may make his presence felt with you and in you. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Vote no on Proposal 3. And know who's running for...